Hey everyone, welcome to the channel and I hope you're doing well. If you're new here, we talk about crime, mystery, and other things, so if you're interested in this type of content, be sure to subscribe. Anyway, let's get into today's case. A world of spies, assassination, and espionage seems like something we would only see in movies, but back in the 1900s, it was all too real. Join me today as we take a dive into the wild life of Ramon Mercader. Jaime Ramón Mercader del Rio was born in Barcelona on the 7th of February, 1913, to mother Eustacia María Caridad del Rio Hernández and father Pablo Mercader Marina. Jaime would become better known as Ramón Mercader. His mother was the daughter of an affluent merchant in Spanish Cuba, and his father was the son of a Catalan textile industrialist. At some stage of Ramon's early childhood, his parents divorced, and he grew up in France with his mother. Eustacia Caridad was a passionate communist, who fought in the Spanish Civil War, serving in the Soviet International Underground. Following in his mother's footsteps, Ramon embraced communism, and worked for leftist groups during the 1930s in Spain. He was even imprisoned for a brief period of time for some of his actions. Ramon was released in 1936 after the left-wing Popular Front coalition won in that year's election. In July of 1936, the Spanish Civil War broke out. Ramon was recruited by an NKVD officer, Nahim Eitingon, and travelled to Moscow to train as a Soviet agent. His cousin, Maria Mercader, was an actress who married Vittoria De Sica, an Italian film director, and father of successful comedy actor, Christian De Sica. The Civil War period is when Ramon started to befriend successful Trotskyists. The relationship between Joseph Stalin and Leon Trotsky is complicated and nuanced, but I'll put it simply. Joseph Stalin practiced the political ideology of Stalinism, where he believed in the socialism in one country theory. He wanted the Soviet Union to focus on establishing a functional socialist Soviet Union, before pushing the spread of communism onto other nations. Leon Trotsky believed in Trotskyism, a different political ideology, where he wanted a permanent revolution. He wanted the Soviet state to focus on spreading communism to other parts of the world. Leon Trotsky did not care how this happened. He didn't care what havoc was caused or how many people died for this to become a reality. After Vladimir Lenin died in January 1924, the question was now posed as to who the next leader of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, known as the USSR, would be. Leon Trotsky was one of the frontrunners from the start, but it wasn't Stalin who was his main competitor at first. Gregory Zinoviev and Lev Kamenev emerged as Trotsky's biggest opposition after Lenin's death. These men felt threatened by Trotsky's popularity and previous military involvement. But a ball had already been set in motion two years prior to Lenin's passing when Lenin gave Stalin the position of General Secretary of the Communist Party. This meant he had authority of a membership in the party and controlled appointments. From this position, Stalin was able to gain influence over the next few years. In Lenin's last months, he deeply regretted his decision of Stalin, but there was no undoing the power he had gained. Stalin sided with Trotsky's two main opponents, and with that, he was able to gain power of the Soviet Union. In 1938, Ramon and another NKVD agent, Maril Zuborovsky, befriended Sylvia Ageloff at the Congress of Trotsky's Fourth International in Paris. Sylvia was a young Jewish American woman, originally from Brooklyn, New York. Ramon took the role of Jacques Monnat a supposed son of a Belgian diplomat. Leon Trotsky was living in Goyacan 
a village on the southern edge of Mexico City, with his family at the time. He had been exiled from the Soviet Union after Stalin gained authority. Sylvia was convinced to move to Mexico City and work for the Trotsky family. Ramon, still posing as Jacques Monnard, told Sylvia that to move with her, he would need to change his identity to avoid military service. This is when Ramon became known as Frank Jackson. His surname was supposed to be Jackson with a CK, but the NKVD forgers misspelt the name. Sylvia was happy with the explanation and the Trotsky household grew used to seeing Frank Jackson daily when he dropped Sylvia off at work. Then, Stalin approved two assassination plans in 1939. The first was an attack led by David Alfaro Siqueiros, a Mexican muralist who was a member of the NKVD. On the 24th of May 1940, David and a team of hitmen dressed as soldiers fired over 200 bullets into Trotsky's home. Shockingly, Leon Trotsky and his wife Natalia survived. What certainly would have felt like a miraculous escape wouldn't last long though. Well, what Trotsky didn't know was that a second attack was already on its way. Since the first assassination attempt failed, a second team was sent to do the job. It was headed up by Nahim Eitingon, the man who had originally recruited Ramon. Ramon and his mother were both on the team. The new plan involved sending in a lone assassin to kill Trotsky. Pavel Sudoplatov revealed in his autobiography, Special Tasks, that he chose Ramon to carry out the assassination. Through Sylvia, Ramon was able to gain access to Trotsky's household as Frank Jackson. He posed as a sympathizer to Trotsky's ideas and beliefs, and befriended his guards. Trotsky's grandson, Esteban Volkov, who was 14 at the time, remembers that Ramon as Jackson was in the house during the first attack. But there was an added complication. After the May attack, security was increased significantly at Trotsky's compound. This resulted in additional locked doors being added, which were controlled by a guard tower. So, in order to escape, Ramon would have to be let out by the guards. But, this wouldn't be possible if they knew that he had just killed Trotsky, which is why an ice axe was selected as the weapon of choice, to offer a silent and quick death, rather than a pistol or a knife. On August 20th, 1940, Ramon was alone with Trotsky in his study. It was his 10th visit to the home. He said he wanted to show Trotsky a draft for a magazine article that he had written. When Trotsky was looking at the document, Ramon struck him in the head with an ice axe, severely wounding him. But Trotsky still put up a fight, screaming for the guards before grabbing Ramon and fighting with him until backup arrived. Trotsky's guards heard the commotion and burst into the office. They began to beat Ramon almost to death. Despite being so wounded, Trotsky was still conscious and ordered his men to spare Ramon's life and allow him to speak. Esteban Volkov recalls, I still remember looking through the open door and seeing my grandfather lying on the floor with his head bathed in blood and hearing him tell somebody to keep the boy away, he shouldn't see this. I always thought that was a sign of his humanity. Even in a moment like that, he was worried about me. Eitingen and Ramon's mother were waiting outside the house with two separate getaway vehicles. When Ramon did not return, the two sped away and left the country. Trotsky was rushed to a hospital and operated on, but died the following day. His cause of death was severe brain injury. He was 60 years old at the time of his death. The guards turned Ramon over to the Mexican authorities. He maintained his name was Jacques Monnard and told police he wanted to marry Sylvia Ageloff, but Trotsky had forbidden it. 
Dramon's story was that he had gotten into a violent altercation with Trotsky, which is why he wanted to murder him. As Ramon put it, instead of finding myself face to face with a political chief who was directing the struggle for liberation of the working class, I found myself before a man who desired nothing more than to satisfy his needs and desires of vengeance and of hate, and who did not utilize the workers' struggle for anything more than a means of hiding his own paltriness and despicable calculations. It was Trotsky who destroyed my nature, my future, and all my affections. He converted me into a man without a name, without country, into an instrument of Trotsky. I was in a blind alley. Trotsky crushed me in his hands, as if I had been paper. Sylvie had also been arrested by Mexican authorities as an accomplice since she had been living with Ramon on and off for two years, leading up to the assassination. Those charges ended up being dropped. In 1943, three years after the assassination, Jacques Monard was sentenced to 20 years in prison for the murder of Leon Trotsky. His real identity came out after the fall of the Soviet Union, and it was finally known that Ramon Mercader was who had really committed the murder. Soon after the assassination, Ramon's mother, Eustacia Caridad, was presented the Order of Lenin for her role in the operation. After serving a few years of his sentence, Ramon requested to be released on parole, but this was denied. Ramon's mother personally applied to Stalin for Ramon to be released. Unfortunately for Ramon, it was not that simple, but Soviet handlers made sure that Ramon was as comfortable as possible. They sent him money weekly and even arranged a girlfriend for him, a Mexican starlet whose name was Rogelia. The couple got married and later had two children together. After serving close to his 20 year sentence, Ramon Mercader was released on May 6th, 1960. From Mexico, Ramon moved to Havana, Cuba with Rogelia. Here, he was welcomed by Fidel Castro's new socialist government. In 1961, at the age of 48, Ramon travelled back to the Soviet Union and was presented the hero of the Soviet Union, the country's highest decoration. He was given this personally by the head of the KGB, Alexander Shelepin. For the remainder of his life, Ramon Mercader split his time between Czechoslovakia Cuba, where he worked as an advisor for the Foreign Affairs Ministry and the Soviet Union. The murder weapon was stored in a Mexico City police evidence room for several years, after the assassination. At some stage, the ice axe was checked out by a secret police officer, Alfredo Salas. He claimed he wanted to preserve the item. Alfredo later passed the axe on to his daughter, Ana Alicia. It remained under her bed for 40 years. In 2005, she decided to put it up for sale. Esteban Volkov offered to give blood for a DNA test to authenticate the weapon, but only if it was donated to the museum at Trotsky's home. Anna declined the offer, mentioning that she wanted some financial benefit. As she put it, I think something as historically important as this should be worth something though. The weapon ended up being purchased by a private American collector, Keith Melton. Melton himself was an author of many books on historical espionage and a founding board member of the International Spy Museum. For Keith, this infamous ice axe was an obsession. It was a search that took me 40 years and up lots of blind alleys and lots of misinformation, he said. Keith followed every rumour or whisper about the weapon, even one that claimed the Mexican president used it as a paperweight. Keith would not say how much he paid for the item. Ramon Mercader passed away in 1978 at the age of 65 in Havana, Cuba after a battle with lung cancer. I hear it always, I hear the scream, I know he's waiting for me, 
on the other side, were said to have been his last words. His body was laid to rest in Moscow's Kunsevo Cemetery. Thank you everyone for watching this video on Ramon Mercader and Leon Trotsky. I hope you found it interesting. Let me know what you thought of the case down below in the comments and if you have any suggestions, also I'll be sure to leave them in the comments. I hope you guys have notifications on so you get all my videos as soon as I upload them. And anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next video. Thanks.